Welcome, everybody, for our next session, Top 10 Agronomy Insights, Less the Roast Beef Lunch. We're very happy to welcome our sponsor, Mazex Seeds, for this session. And our two presenters will be Greg Stewart, Lead Agronomist with Mazex Seeds, and Kirk Van Will, Territory Manager with Mazex Seeds. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you today. We appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we've taken the, uh, the idea that there's been a lot of good information flying around this winter. And, uh, and the, uh, the beauty of it is there's, we've, we've learned lots and uh, we just didn't get to get together to have the roast beef lunch. But we're going we're gonna to go through what we think are some of the top 10 things that we've talked about over this uh, past year. So we'll start with corn planting depth. And corn planting depth is a three-year project that we've been tackling at Mazex. And we'll go right to the idea of what is our final analysis on corn planting depth. Here's the summary from 59 sites over 2018, 2019, and 2020. Average yields. So the two-inch planting did 207. The three-inch planting did 209. Not, uh, not too much difference there. And then when we looked at final populations, two inch was 30,739, three inch 31,515. If we looked at the number of sites where the two inch seemed to be the yield winner, that is it won by more than three bushels per acre, that was 20% of the time. If we look at our three inch planting depth, 36% of the time did the three-inch planting depth win. So that, uh, that means that, of course, 44% of the time, uh, there was no real difference between the two-inch and the three-inch. Kirk, uh, when, you look at those, uh, when you look at those summaries from our three-year trial, all that work by Chuck Belanger, what do you say? Well, it's quite intriguing that you've got that about 1,000 more plants come up under three-inch depth. That's uh, quite intriguing. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea, and that was fairly consistent, uh, that uh, we seem to be able to generate a little more population by planting a little bit deeper. So if we go to our conclusions from this trial, if we talk about delayed planting, so that would be sort of after the, the middle of May, it was really clear in our data that when you get into that delayed planting, that the three inch perform better. Uh, when you were talking early planting, and that would be principally in 2020, uh, the two inch performed better, especially on heavy soils. And then if we talk about trench closure problems, that was the other thing that jumped out at us, is that if you had some challenges getting the seed trench closed just as nicely as you'd like, uh, <laughs> one of the simple fixes there would be to just get it planted a little bit deeper. And then Kirk, Overall risk to planting deeper, you know, really, uh, really uh, quite low when you when you look at the uh, the comparisons of of two versus three inches, and worried that oh my gosh, if I go deeper than two inches, I'll pay a serious price. Didn't really see much of that, Kirk. No, other than and the only comment I come from more of a clay background. Just watch the clay. Uh, you know, we said three inches, but I would stress to a lot of guys. We probably don't need to be three to achieve this project, uh, Greg. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two may not be deep enough, but three may be too deep in some cases. All right. So let's move on to early soybean planting. Awesome. Well, we had a session with uh, Horse Bonner and yourself, and uh, we took a look at uh, planting dates. And the idea behind it, uh, early planting beans, uh, possibly even ahead of corn. And so if we look at the data, uh, you can see that we've got some very early planting dates, April 22nd through to the, the end of April. And if you look over at the, uh, the plant stand, you, there are little differences, but ultimately on the plant yield side, we don't see much of a difference on that yield. Same comment for the May 22nd, Greg. I would say you're you're very similar in yield. It's not till we hit that June 10th time frame that we see a drastic drop in yield. So the idea that maybe we can be planting beans much earlier. Yeah, yeah. And I think the the interesting thing from horse data is that this April 22nd corn uh, had uh, what 13 nights where the temperature was below zero. So this is this is clearly uh, cold 
planting conditions, and yet the yields hung in there pretty nicely uh, as you've uh, as you've laid out. Yeah, and so yeah, when you take a look at that overall summary, Greg, then four four bushel increase. So the idea that you know if we want to plant early, planting either with a full season or a little longer day bean than what we normally would would help us achieve this four bushel increase that Horst is showing. Yeah, if you go early, make sure if you want to capitalize on all the early planting benefits, you've got to be a full season or maybe even a full season plus soybean variety. So I think we've kind of covered a couple things there, Greg, but basically, you know, plant early. Emergence isn't as critical as it is in corn, right? And that we we want to go a little bit earlier, or sorry, fuller season with our soybean. Right. So the key question that came up when we had this uh, discussion uh, was with uh, Horace Bonner and Paul Sullivan, the agronomist from Eastern Ontario, uh, is this idea of are there some planting days, these would be some of the earliest planting days possible, that we should be planting soys instead of corn? I think uh, horse sort of straddled the fence and said that, well, probably both of them could could do well. Uh, but Paul was very, uh, very adamant that uh, that he thinks this is a great idea to take some of those earliest planting days and be planting soys instead of the corn. Kirk, you're you run in some heavier ground world. What's your What's your feeling on that takeaway? Yeah, not as comfortable there, Greg. I mean, we struggle. Uh, we've struggled the last few years just getting a corn crop in the ground on some of our heavier clays. You know, you miss that window. It's it's hard to get in there. So I'd struggle with that. But I I would stress that as we come towards the end of corn planting, where we're waiting for that last field, maybe giving an extra day or two to dry, that there may be an opportunity to put 200, 100 acres of beans in at that point in time. Maybe do a uh, yeah. little flipping over. Yeah, yeah. So not necessarily before your first field of corn, but certainly before your last field of corn. There you go. <laughs> Depending on the soil type. Excellent. Good, good. So let's move on to number three, uh, corn uniformity of emergence. Well, we have beat this topic to death over the last uh, 20 years as to how uniform the crop needs to come up. We had Missy Bauer from uh, Coldwater, Michigan, and she went down the same road. You know, we've talked about this interesting idea of marking each plant as it comes up. Uh, you know, we've called it the flag test or the popsicle stick test. And in Missy's work, she segregated them by 12 hours. That is plants that were up uh, in the at the 12 hour uh, part of the, the discussion versus 12 hours later versus 12 hours later. So at any rate, they're really in, intriguing. And and Missy uh, pushed the needle even further on this discussion when she showed some of her data that plants that came up 12 hours later, so this would be plants that came up uh, at the 12-hour mark versus plants that came up 12 hours later and showed pretty significant yield reductions even for 12 hours. So, Kirk, we've been talking about this for years in terms of the impact of being uh, 24 hours late emerger or maybe 48 hours late emerger. In this case, Missy's ratcheting it up to suggest that even 12 hours late could cause a significant yield hit for those plants that came up late. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's it's. Uh, I mean, there's quite a drop in yield, obviously there, and so yeah. I think you know a couple key messages. One is that's the the yield off the one plant or you know, however many are late, right? It's not right. the full crop sure. as a loss. So keep that in mind. But it is very intriguing that, you know, Peter Johnson's done a lot of this work in terms of the flag test. We've looked at it. The industry's looked at it. There's a ton of stuff out here supporting this idea about uniformity for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I do like your reminder that this is the, the yield drop for those individual plants. If you had very, very few of those individual plants, it's obviously going to impact your yield less. If you get a significant, significant number of these late emergers, the risk is going to be more. The thing that jumped out at me, Kirk, was this planting date, uh, June, the, June the 3rd, right? And, and what that meant in terms of Missy's interpretation was that when you get into those later planting dates, 
those corn plants are going to come up fast. And if you have a seed that's missing uh, the takeoff because it didn't get planted deep enough and is not into moisture, there's some, there's some increased risk there. So if we go to our conclusions, well, we continue to reinforce this idea of the penalty for late emergers. That hasn't gone away. If, if anything, it's been strengthened. I still think that, generally speaking, a good goal for most growers is to have all plants up in that 48-hour window. But reinforce this idea that when you get late planting under warm conditions, it's imperative that all the seeds get into moisture. That one seed left behind in, uh, in a 17 and a half foot uh, length of row because it didn't get into moisture may get left behind badly if all the other seeds are taken off because we're under warm conditions. Well, and think about, you know, you just presented some information from Chuck Boulanger and our, our team that did the depth trials. You know, think about that three inch comment here and we look at the winds that probably yes. falls more on our late planted crops, right? Yeah, yeah. The three inch with three inch was the dominant winner when we got into late planting and probably plays to this idea of how critical it is to get them all into moisture if you're going to be late planting under warm conditions. Good point, Kirk. So we're moving on to number four, final ear count. So this has been our work from the uh, from the Great Ontario Yield Tour. Here's the number from this year. The 2020 Great Ontario Yield Tour was 29,449 plants. That's the lowest final ear count we've had in, uh, in five years. If we just look at the analysis quickly, so there's our ear count. 16 and a half rows around on average, 33 kernels in length on average. If we use that as our sort of kernels per bushel, the yield tour would have came in at about that 183. Agricore for last year was a 178. So we're sort of in the game. Uh, but what I want you to think about is leave all those numbers the same, but get a 32,000 ear count, leave all of these. And now we're up 16 bushels compared to where we were in uh, in a twenty nine five year count, so that's that's intriguing to Six, me. Sixteen, Greg, that's a big number. <laughs> yeah, and 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 is that real? I, yeah, I'd be surprised if going from twenty nine five to thirty two thousand nets you out a full sixteen bushel. But but there's got to be some yield there. It it might be half that. But even if it's half that, and none of your other expenses go up, uh, it's it's certainly something we got to consider. Yes, so I would tend to concur there, Greg, on that comment. And if you look at the, you know, this slide here, I think as I go around the countryside, you know, everybody knows kind of what their planting or their intended seed drop was. Most guys tend to be able to, you know, give us that uh, what the plant stand was as we go out in June, let's say, and do some plant stands. But the one that I find most intriguing is we probably aren't recording uh, very well or or taking into account what that year count is so we come around to yield to our time i think you know if we could know those three numbers mm. at a given operation i think you can start to piece some stuff back together a lot better greg in terms of performance yeah that's a that's a nice comment kirk uh think of the value if you could go out and identify a section or a row length or a piece of a field and know exactly what the seed drop was there what the June 15th plant count was there, and then come back and do an ear count, you could certainly start to, add, to make some progress in terms of where you need to change things if you do all three of those numbers. For sure. Seed treatments. So we've been playing around with seed treatments and soybeans for a while. Uh, being in the clay, clay belt uh, or part of a clay belt, we tend to look at a lot of things here in terms of our soybean and emergence. And you know, over the years, we've kind of, we haven't struggled, but we've we've seen differences in this heavy clay comment, uh, Greg. Right. And so in the slide here, you've got uh, basically Lumacina on our left. Uh, I'll, so we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Probably most growers are familiar with the Vibrance Max in the middle. And so if you look at that stand and then compared to the Vibrance Max apron, at Maze X, we've been playing with this idea of topping up apron to uh, to increase our phytophthora uh, resistance or tolerance. And uh, then you look over at Lumacina. So at Mazex, you know, 
the middle picture vibrance max compared to Apermax. max Aper max looked a little better but i would suggest to you that on the screen the lumicina looks that much greater and uh, so for a good chunk of our beans coming this year we're going to seriously look at that lumicina comment greg right and then uh, uh here uh, so we talked about the standard the uptreated and the lumicina the next step, I think, Greg, that you're going to see is uh, Lumicina, perhaps with Saltro. Uh, Saltro's new, looks after uh, SDS, sudden death syndrome. Right. So what's Saltro going to cost a grower if he'd like to treat his seed with Saltro for the SDS, uh, SCN play? Yeah, you're going to be $14 a unit, Greg. Right. So it's, it, it sounds expensive, but if uh, those that have been involved in SDS with a sudden death syndrome, it can hurt uh, significantly. And what percentage of your fields, Kirk, would suffer from a risk, a serious risk of SDS, um, SCN problems? Most growers are probably uh, in pockets or, you know, in, in zones. But yep. I have seen up this way fields where, you know, we can see 25% of a field taken out by SDS pretty easily in spots. So it's yeah. it's another one of those need to do your scouting, need to do your agronomy homework to know if you need that prescription. And I guess if there's ever a year to try some more expensive seed treatments, uh, this would be the year to do it if beans uh, if beans keep going the way they've been going price-wise. Yes. All right, so uh, we'll wade into strip tillage, one of my favorite topics. We had uh, Ben Rosser, the Omafra corn specialist, join us for a discussion about strip tillage and whether to put the fertility down in the fall versus the spring. Uh, he was joined by Mike Cornelison from Lambton County, and we had a nice discussion about, oh, Jill, the whole idea of putting fertilizer down in the strip. This is the one slide that I'll, uh, that I'll show you from Ben Rosser, where essentially the comparison was, if you're on a ground or, or, or soil, that you could either do fall strips or spring strips, and you could obviously put the fertilizer down in the fall or the spring, was there an advantage to doing it in the strip in the uh, in the spring strip with the fertilizer? And we're talking P and K. And his sites over two years now show about a five bushel advantage for uh, for doing the fertilizer under a spring strip scenario compared to the fall strip. And there was a couple that it went the other way, but on average, it looks like there's a bit of a trend for these uh, spring strips with P and K to kick out a little more yield than side-by-side -side fall strips with the same P and K. So you had, so that's Ben's data that you just discussed this is there, Ben's data, yep. And you had uh, Mike Cornelson. What was his comments behind this? Yeah, so... For starters, Mike farms on ground that has considerably higher uh, soil tests, like the, the ground has been built up in terms of soil tests P and K, uh, and uh, compared to where Ben was on. And I think Mike would suggest that he doesn't see this big advantage or consistent advantage to spring strip fertilizer versus, versus fall strips. Uh, he doesn't see this. And, and and to Ben's credit, he went out onto sites where he could find a response. So on lower testing ground. And I think that's been the uh, the general trend that if you're on more responsive ground, lower P and K, you see this tendency towards having more of a spring uh, impact. And so this was the key question. This is one of my favorite questions in agronomy. Can the planter run fertilizer free if you're on a fertilized strip? And well, let's start out by saying that the conclusions are not conclusive. I think we would agree that it's more likely that the planter could run fertilizer free if you're already on high testing soils, sort of regardless of whether it's fall strips or spring strips. And it's more likely that the planter could run fertilizer free if the fertilizer is applied in a spring strip, but where the placement of the fertilizer and the incorporation of the fertilizer is really well done within the zone. If you're trying to replace pop-up and two-by-two -two bands, you're going to have to have that fertilizer nicely mixed into the zone, not off to the side or in bands where the planter or, or where the corn plant doesn't experience it as a starter. And of course, Kirk, I'll throw at you on this concluding slide, is that we've got good data examples of it going both ways on whether you need uh, the uh, planter 
fertilizer equipped or not? I still think it's a great question for for guys, especially interested in strip till, to dig into to see what the answer is on that one. Well, and it sounds like a great uh, government uh, response there, Greg. But so from your side, what is what do you envision planters looking like then? Yeah, well, I appreciate the lead in because if I was going to spend $350,000 on a strip tiller and have it fully equipped to do an awesome job of strip till and incorporate fertilizer in the zone, I would really hope that my planter could look like this three-point hitch, seed only, just go, baby. Yeah, for sure. And so to add into your comments, Greg, uh, this is a little tweak, uh, some bio strip tillage uh, through the Ontario Ag uh, Conference this year. Uh, Lawrence Hogan and Steve Howard, along with Ian McDonald, did quite a presentation around some unique work they're doing. And the top picture basically is after uh, winter wheat comes off, they, they, they put their cover crop in and you can see it looks a little bit like rows. So they've got one species of uh, cover crop going where the wheel tracks would go and they have a different species going down where the uh, planter, where the corn row should run. Right. On. And then the last, the other picture in the other, the bottom right corner would be just the mature uh, oh, crop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there you go with some sunflowers and some mix that they've got. Right which on. ultimately leads to another tweak. So your last picture there, Greg, you know, that they're doing a little different tweak with uh, strip tilling, but it's a very unique concept. Hey, that is, uh, that is interesting. The beauty of a strip till system where your wheels can run on well-supported ground and, uh, and the planter could run, well, in this case, is, is maybe a superior seed bed driven by a different cover crop species. That, that, is, uh, that is exciting. And this that was planted no till just to note right? right so no no actual strip till unit went oh, through there oh yeah yeah gotcha right strip till I got to get my head around the uh, the roots not iron idea here there you go yeah excellent so the other thing we'll chat about is critical early season of nitrogen so over over the years. Uh, we've been intrigued by how much nitrogen you need in the row zone to maximize yield and to make sure that the plant is off to an awesome start. And as we've talked about moving more and more nitrogen uh, from, uh, from pre-plant or planting time to side dress time or to uh, later applications uh, into July applications, I get increasingly worried about just in, in some situations whether we short the crop uh, too much up front. So we had one little trial uh, down with uh, Julie Ma, Moore Ma Farms down in Lampton, where they planted, the, we planted the corn, and then I came back over and created some plots where we added about 40 pounds of extra nitrogen, uh, either right over the row, just after planting or in between, and saw a nice bump in yield, um, you know, uh, quite a significant bump in yield. And so that led me to believe, wow, in this particular field, even though there was about 50-ish pounds of nitrogen down up front, maybe not enough of it was concentrated into the row zone to meet the early season requirements. And so when we think about doing plot work uh, in 2021, uh, we would really like to focus on pulling soil nitrate samples from the row zone. We'll have to pull multiple samples because of some of the fertilizer banding and what have you, but pulling samples from the row zone to check to see whether we're at that critical concentration of sort of 40 to 50 parts per million to meet the early season requirements of that corn crop as it moves sort of from the V2 stage on. So let me get that straight then, Greg, because normally we've always uh, done our nitrogen testing just before side dress time. This would yep. be you know, going quite a bit earlier. Yeah, so we'll still pull side dress samples in order to help evaluate what the side dress nitrogen rate should be. But this is going to go right back to sort of three leaf corn and pull the samples in that zone to evaluate whether or not we've got enough nitrate in the zone. If you could consider a guy maybe that, you know, puts 10 gallons of 28 down, so he's got 30 pounds of N broadcast over the field, and then he might only be five gallons of 624, six in furrow. In those situations, do we run a little short of nitrogen up front and, and what might that cost us? So, yeah, we're, we're going to make you do a little more soil sampling this year, Kurt. Well, there you go. That looks awesome. <laughs> uh, 
uh, intensive corn management. So we've, we've done, uh, well, I say we, but that's a good ch- uh, part of your team, Greg, uh, in the world of Mazex. We've done a lot of work in the intensive corn management side, ultimately trying to understand our hybrids so that we can kind of talk to our growers about what they should do and how to manage them properly. And uh, I would say, so we three main things, Greg, populations, yep. fungicide, and then the intensive work in terms of a standard population versus a high rate, adding 50 pounds of nitrogen and then the fungicide to right. look at uh, the results. And so you can see here, you know, uh, this site here, we looked at a, a hybrid, uh, a bunch of, uh, well, this is one, isn't it, Greg? One hybrid? Yeah, this is, no, this is the full suite of them here. This is the full package, okay? Yeah, all all so, eight hybrids. So we've got, you know, a low population of red at the 24, 32 being our standard, and then the 32 plus uh, the fungicide, and the 38 is a high rate, and then the 38,000 uh, plus the 50 pounds of N and a fungicide. And you can see if we back over to go back over to your thirty-two thousand with a fungicide, Greg. Yeah, you can see that that we seem to get this past year quite a nice kick by just being a standard population, but by adding fungicide. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Over the you know, if you looked at your intensive managed package, so thirty-eight thousand plus fifty plus the fungicide, you've probably seen more of a response there in years past, Greg. Is that right? Yeah, this was sort of the intriguing thing about 2020 is that uh, when we went the, to 38,000 seeds and 50 pounds of nitrogen and the fungicide, in many situations, we just sort of got back to where we were at at 32,000 with the fungicide. And so uh, I think some of the dry conditions in July, as we went from the 1st of July towards the end of July, and we were relatively short on rainfall in many places uh, during that period that we sort of shaved the top off what we might have got by increasing the population or adding 50 pounds of nitrogen. That makes sense. So then, uh, Kirk, we'll just throw these two hybrids at you. So this is 4040 yeah. uh, versus 3877. And this is sort of the classic response. This is what we really would like to see in terms of understanding our hybrids. You know, this looks kind of racehorsey like, you know, some pretty significant improvements as we move uh, from population, improvements in population, and in this case, improvements in nitrogen and or fungicide versus, I don't know, 3877. Well, it needed more than than uh, 24,000 plants, but once you got the population to 32, its response to other inputs was, uh, was uh, pretty workhorse-like, if you know what I mean. Yeah, pretty pretty uh, good information to have at our fingertips uh, when you get into the conversations of, you know, should I be spraying a fungicide, which hybrid should I spray or focus on, and so on. So that's pretty pretty good stuff, Greg. Cool, cool. Tracks on planters. Uh, so that was another one, another session I took in through the Ontario Ag uh, Conference this year, Greg. Yeah. And uh, you know, Dr., uh, I believe it's Scott Shear. Uh, he, uh, they took a look at the pinch row. So as we've moved to planters now that are bigger size planters for a bunch of guys, the idea behind it being more efficient, we've got a central tank located up on that planter. The weight uh, on those rows is tremendous right underneath that, that hopper. And so you can see that uh, Scott Shear, Dr. Scott, Scott, Scott Shear looked at replacing the wheels with tracks as an interesting conversation. Um, and you can see if you get close enough to the screen, the tracks there, they, they floated a little bit better on the dirt. And you can see if you look behind the wheels, that there's more of an indentation on the ground right. in between those rows, creating that pinch row study. Cool. And this this will be a little hard to see in terms of the data that he, that he had. But if you summarize it, it's basically saying that on average, after they took those wheels away and put tracks in its place, there was about a 5.7 bushel advantage for tracks, Greg. Yeah, interesting. So I was involved in a little presentation down at SWAC where uh, Jeff Cook was the presenter, and he farms with his family uh, just west of London, and they made the conversion from wheels to tracks. Now, obviously, he couldn't do side-by-sides because they took the, the wheels off and put tracks on, but I believe numbers were sort of in the neighborhood of 
you know, showing about a 10, maybe 12 bushel penalty uh, for the pinch rows when you had wheels on. And then when he replaced them with tracks, uh, the uniformity across the planter looked almost perfect. So, so got rid of, got rid of what looked to be most of the pinch row problems in his situation. That's interesting. Yeah. Right on. I mean, so that, yeah, just a, another thought process of different sessions I've seen this year, Greg. Good, good. Appreciate it. And we control on beans. So we hosted, uh, Mike Colbert was gracious, gracious enough to join us along with Henry Prinzen. Uh, Mike, of course, is the Omafra weed specialist. Henry Prinzen is a territory manager uh, with us over in the Haldeman area. And uh, we talked about weed control and soybeans. And so our session there, Greg, looked at uh, comparing some chemistry. So the Enlist ver side of the business in terms of 2,4-D versus the Extend side. And uh, I just threw two two screenshots of our presentation up on the screen here but if we look at the uh flea bane side right we look in, and say that ingenia gives us maybe better performance over the enlist side that provided that we're spraying at the proper times and so on that's that's compared just, to a guy just that's the canada looking flea bane, at giant right? reg oh that was just the canada flea yes bane, that right? is correct yep right yes and the, and then if you you know, the bottom that part of the giant slide there, Greg, giant rag. Yep. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. And so a little less performance for the Ingenia, unless the 2,4-D side looks stronger. So right. part of the message behind that session, Greg, I think was essentially the idea that as a grower, you need to pick and choose what's best for your operation and the farms, different weed species, maybe the cause for us to change herbicides. The genetics behind them may be part of the reason, but ultimately safety comes into that conversation too, Greg. Yeah, I suppose if you stay want to stay in the extend world, you do have the advantage of those pre-emergence applications of dicamba that give you some real nice soil residual activity that, that you wouldn't have in the enlist program, right? That's true. And your but key on, word there, Greg's probably pre. Yes, right. And then of course on the enlist side, you sort of win on the in crop side where now you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be spraying, you know, a product that has got much less uh, in crop risk, volatilization risk than, uh, than you would have with the extend platform. Yeah. And then the last comment probably that, uh, that I would throw in Greg would be, you know, in terms of crop rotation. So there's some restrictions with vegetable crops and some other things in terms of what we can and can't do. So, you know, Amazex, we're offering both systems here this coming year and be able to uh, assess each field as a field-by-field -field case. Yeah, excellent. Hey, I think that gets us to the end. So we would like to thank you for uh, listening to us go over uh, these top 10 tips. Of course, we'd like to thank all of the great work done by presenters across Ontario uh, this winter. It's been tough, but there's been a, a wealth of information shared. And of course, we all look forward to being able to have these agronomy discussions uh, when it's mixed in with a bit of roast beef next winter. So uh, thanks very much. And if you have questions, Here's our email addresses on this last slide. Excellent. Well, thank you, Greg and Kurt. That was um, a, a lot of really good information and a good summary of the presentations you've done this past winter. Folks, if you haven't had a chance to check out the polls that came through during Greg and Kirk's presentation, there's some questions about agronomy, and there's also some questions about your gravy preferences for roast beef, because <laughs> both of those are equally important. Right on. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. And a big thank you to Mazex Seeds, our sponsor for this session. We're looking forward to the next session coming up for the London Farm Show.